of anybody who owns um, a hi-fi system, sometimes it happens in home theater, is RF radio frequency interference. And the most common form of it uh, is picking up a, a radio station um, playing through your system while you're trying to listen to something else. And unfortunately, Cincinnati is probably one of the hottest trouble spots for radio frequency interference with the number of radio towers we have, the hills that we have, um, particularly in the downtown area. So I've had 40 years of experience of dealing with with radio frequency interference. Now, the common lore um, is that um, radio frequency interference is because you have a vacuum tube, this or that, preamp or power amp. And I'll be quite sincere in saying, well, there might be a tendency but trust me, I've had plenty of RF problems with solid state. Okay, so let's, let's deal with common lore and put it to the side. Because what we're really talking about is how do I get rid of RF in my system? And the building block, the key to it is real simple. It's called find the source. Now, most of the time, radio frequency interference is getting into the system by a single product or a single point. Um, occasionally, it can be multiple points, but we've got to find the source. Where, how is it getting into the system? And I'm not going to talk about how to build rooms to deal with it. I've done that for some of the major people in the industry. Um, I'm just going to help you try to figure it out at home. So the first thing you got to do if you're going to try to find the source is you have to be empirical about your methodology. And the rule is one piece at a time. This means that as you try to find the source, you can't be making multiple changes to the system because you'll have no idea where the offending source is. Um, one of the best places to start um, is um, on the preamp or integrated is to short down the inputs. So you're getting rid of anything that could get into the preamp or integrated amp and you get RCA plugs where the uh, center pin and the shield are soldered together so it acts as a shunt. It, it completely closes things down. And you go across all of the inputs and yeah you'll have to unplug things you got plugged in because you don't know where it's coming from but you shut down everything leading into these two sources and then listen to the system if you're not getting rf that's a good indication that it's neither coming from the preamp or the integrated amplifier so now you got to figure out okay where if you get it on an integrated, uh, and we'll bring power amp into this as well. If you get RF, then the next question becomes in this relationship, how is it getting into, you know, the integrated amplifier or coming out of the power amp? And one of the big, big places it can happen where you don't expect it is the speaker cable because some cable designs are not shielded. And so depending upon their length, they can actually act as an antenna. Um, I've seen it happen. 
and merely changing the speaker cable, that was the end of the RF. But this is really rare, okay? But don't preclude that. Um, one way you can get around that, at least there's a preamp and an integrated, uh, is to remove the speaker cable and use headphones. Now you don't have the speaker cable attached and you're actually listening to the circuitry of these two products. Okay, so that's part one. Okay, so now we're getting into the next chapter, which is the shorted inputs. Then what you begin to do, you can do it a couple different ways. I like to first unplug one input at a time. So what you're doing is, let's say you have uh, one, two, three, four, five. You open this one up, see what you've got going on. If you've got nothing, then go back and close this one and go to the next one and proceed across. Now, one of the common areas that you'll find in this slot here is a phono stage. You have to keep in mind that the phono stage is designed to amplify a moving magnet uh, by a factor of 10 moving coil, maybe a factor of 100 over a line level input. So it is inherently more sensitive to um, any current that it can find. So the phono stage is typic can be typically the problem, not always. But you do this process first. If you come up empty-handed, then the next step, while keeping um, the inputs closed, is you introduce one product at a time. And you may have multiple items, so you might have a CD player, you might have a turntable, you might have all sorts of things, a DVD player, and you know, all, it goes. And you keep the other one shut and begin to put in product at a time, next step, next product, okay? Making sure you're keeping everything else closed except for what you're trying to find. This oftentimes will flush it out. Um, and it may be a combination of the input and the product. Um, so we've had cases where the phono stage itself shunt it down, does nothing. The minute we open it up, we don't hear anything. The minute we attach a turntable, there's RF. Bam. But you have to keep in mind any device that is designed to pick up a you know, real low voltage signal um, is a suspect. So guess what? I have had F, you know, RF sneak in through cassette deck or um, not too often now, but uh, VCR heads. So you go through this whole process and the minute you plug in the cassette deck, <laughs> there's RF. Um, and I've had it sneak in through VCRs. And this is more common um, in home theater systems, obviously, but it can come in that way. So you have to follow the rule of do one step at a time, you know, all shorted, and then start introducing product. So you have an idea of where the offending RF is coming in. Now, occasionally, uh, it's real rare, um, but you might have this going on plus the speaker cable. This is the sneaky sucker um, because this is when you have two offending sources in a system, which is why I try to go back and isolate one step at a time to try to figure out where it is. This can be painstaking, particularly if you've got all your equipment in some sort of rack that's, uh, or a bookcase. I'm sorry, but all I can suggest is you know, getting a table, setting it down, and just simply go through it. There's no other way around it. Um, there are occasional other sources of RF that are not radio stations. Um, years ago, the most common one was um, CB radio, uh, particularly if they were doing uh, 
transmission illegally, because CB is limited to four watts, but guys, and even truckers, you know, because I use CB radio on the road, will kick a 100 watt or a 1,000 watt linear on it, and the next thing I know, I'm in West Virginia listening to somebody in Texas, you know, and that's gonna be, if that's close to you, that's gonna bleed through a system. Um, the funniest one I ever had here um, was I was doing a nice demonstration, and the next thing I know, I was listening to a taxi cab. So again, again, a different band. Um, so CB radio could be um, a different source. And so anything is, is broadcasting in, in a sense can be a new intermittent or, you know, a rare occasion, you know. Uh, if you can't keep the RF constant for you to do this research, there's no way of chasing it down. But this is how you, you know, this is the simple way of trying to figure out where the RF is coming from. Now, we'll go to the third step. Okay, now I've talked about the common things, but I'm gonna give you a fun, a few, a road down the, the road of sneaky bastards. And um, we just solved one for one customer, but the sneaky bastards are ones that are not RF being generated from outside the home, but actually being generated within the home. Um, and so you'll see like on uh, the back of CD players and, and DVD players, um, an FCC registration because they do emit RF. It's supposed to be real low level of control. But um, products themselves, um, depending upon how they're put on the shelf, and I should do the retail one, you know, location, location, location. Um, RF can come in by the proximity of one product to the next. Um, so not all RF is, you know, a radio station. Um, some RF can actually be uh, the transformers of the power amplifiers throwing such a magnetic field that it's interfering with the performance of the preamp. It's a different form of RF, but it's there. Um, and we talk about location. Uh, most recently, we had a chap who was... Um, very heavily into a number of computers in the same room as this turntable. And uh, I don't know what he, what he does with all of them. Maybe he's a graphics designer, maybe he's a day trader. It really didn't matter because he couldn't enjoy his turntable because of all the RF noise, just general background noise being generated by being in that environment. And so uh, in his case, um, the solution turned into um, getting an outboard phono stage, um, Riga to be exact, um, which are really good against radio frequency interference. Um, they don't usually show any exhibits of it. And that was the end of his RF. So he could listen to his music while being in, a, I guess, a cavern of computers. So you have to watch out for, um, you know, what I would call um, non audio products. Uh, a very common one years ago, we don't see them too much anymore, um, are um, the lamp dimmers. Um, oftentimes they would show up in how they screw up the electric, but lamp dimmers and things like that could in fact create interference within the system. And it took more of the form of a static as opposed to listening to um, music or, you know, the taxi cab or whatnot. And so as you're going through all the diagnostics trying to figure it out, one of the things you have to watch out for are these guys because when you're doing all that other testing, no matter what you do, you still keep having the same problem. And so then you got to start looking around for, okay, what do I have in my home or my office um, that could be generating some sort of field? Um, in office spaces, it can be as difficult as being located on a different floor and beneath you is some sort of medical laboratory, you know, popping x-rays and everything else. Well, those huge magnetic fields can create all sorts of havoc. Um, not very common. Most people are home, they don't have anything like that. But you have to watch out for these guys. Just be conscious that that can exist. So 
when you're doing the earlier testing, if you're not having any success in what you're trying to hunt down, then start looking around for these guys because they do exist. Most of the dimmers today um, don't generate um, problems. Um, you know, uh, fluorescent lights were notorious for creating havoc on AM radios. If you turned a fluorescent light on, the next thing you know, you had, you know, that was the end of it. So um, these, these guys are fun uh, because when you find one, you just kind of laugh because you got me, so to speak. So that's the sneaky ones. Next stage. Okay, now we're going to start talking about cures, and I have a funny little I call, can you replace electronics soon? And a lot of times the cures don't involve replacing the electronics. Um, one of the common ones for um, vacuum tube amplifiers, particularly if they don't have um, a tube cage, uh, is to add a cage that is grounded. In other words, just the screwing it to the unit itself is not good enough. You actually have to ground it to an outlet. That sometimes may or may not work. Um, the other one is sometimes manufacturers will offer a modified way of doing it and that's either by them or a kit that they will send you. Now, the question comes up, well, if they have this RF problem, why didn't they just do this anyway? Well, quite often in their circuit designs, when these things go in, it compromises the performance of the product, which is why they didn't put them in. Yours is a unique case. This is what we've got to do for you. Um, so that's another approach that you can get into. The other one is real simple. Doesn't cost you a dime. Don't use it. Okay? Um, simply because you own something doesn't mean you have to use it. I mean, really, how often do you pull a cassette tape out or a VCR tape? If that's connected to the system and that's the offending piece, unplug it and be done with your pr and get on with your life. So you do have a solution that it doesn't cost you a dime. Um, if you insist upon using it, well, we got to figure out how to deal with that problem. Nine, nine out of ten times, there's nothing you can do about the you know the cassette deck heads picking it up, and that's it. End of story. Um, Sometimes you do get into replacement of the offending product um, or adding um, an element. So we had a case where um, he, you know, this this happened with um, one of our rogue audio pieces, the Cronus Magnum, lovely piece. Um, we sell a lot of them, actually. And he went into downtown Cincinnati into radio frequency hell. And he couldn't listen to his turntable. We did the diagnostics, figured out where it was. And interestingly enough, the problem was isolated to the phono stage in the integrated amplifier itself. It wasn't in the preamp level. It wasn't any place else. It was just the phono stage. The solution for him was real simple. He bought an outboard Riga phono stage RF gone. Now, you, you hopefully don't have to do that, but as I said, um, downtown Cincinnati, um, you know, the only place we had here that was worse than downtown Cincinnati is, you know, we had a 50,000 watt clear channel station called WLW, and they worked off the Voice of America up the road here, and you know, I swear if you just roll the tire by the place, you still hear something. I mean, it was a lot of power. So um, replacement of the actual complete product may or may not be necessary by adding something else. And this is kind of the basics um, of trying to deal with RF. Each situation is unique. 
Each situation may be a single event. It can be multiple events. Multiples are hard, but keep in mind the very first step is you have to empirically change one thing at a time so that you have an understanding. Yes, this is it. No, this isn't it. If you start changing multiple things at the same time, it, you, you might as well be pouring black paint into to white and stirring it and then being instructed to pull the black paint out of it. it it's, it's not going to work. You have to be very empirical, very patient. And um, it can take an hour. It can take five hours. Sometimes it may take um, multiple more hours, you know, because you've got your life to live too. So you check a few things, it doesn't work. Okay, tomorrow I'll try something else. That's okay. But remember where you are, take notes if you really want to be smart so you have an understanding uh, of what you've already done. Because we're all busy and get phones and calls and interrupt our thoughts. And you may or may not remember where you were in your steps. But documentation of what's going on. And if you have to, and you're working with a dealer who does in fact give service because you bought the quality and you paid the price, okay, then consult the dealer to see if he has any ideas. He may or may not. Um, I will admit that some of the um, news groups or comment boards can also be useful if you type in, you know, RF problem with my product. And you may have a whole litany of people talking about, yeah, I did, and this is what I had to do. That's fine. I, I you know, self-help is a great thing. Uh, I do it myself in products that I'm, you know, projects I'm working on. But the dealer may be aware of what's going on or what the potentials are and, and give you the assistance. Um, if it's a good dealer, yeah, they'll be there. Um, I'll have a couple of customers coming in, uh, hopefully in the next few months, talking about doing battles with RS so they can... Um, Calm your nerves about, you know, this is what we had to do, but this is why, and these were the steps I did.